Deus Ex Mankind Divided is a beautiful, astounding powerhouse of design and gameplay, while at the same time it manages to be disappointing in story and theme. It both feels like a massive step forward in terms of level design, exploration, and world design, while being a step backward in terms of writing. Don't get me wrong, I don't think this ruins the game at all. Mankind Divided should be experienced. Its new hub world begs to be explored, with hours and hours of traipsing around to be done. Multiple playthroughs still won't even do this game's level justice. It's an incredible feat of modern design and just has something that we don't really see too often these days. But its story leaves something to be desired. Playing this scenario now, thinking back to the interest, subtlety, and tact that the original Deus Ex had, makes me want for something more. If you've never really played Deus Ex for the story, and are more here for the breaking the simulation with augmentations and stealth trickery, then this game is definitely for you. But if you joined the series because you wanted some of that world-running conspiracy and cool, edgy cyberpunk aesthetic, then we're kind of far gone from that. While I do think that Human Revolution took the series in a new direction with its themes and general design, I think that Mankind Divided tends to give those same themes an incredibly heavy hand. I have to commend the team in general, though, for trying something new. This game did try to go in a new direction, with that same formula in almost every way. This needs to be commended because it could really be easy to just do the same thing as Human Revolution while tweaking some knobs and valves slightly. Mankind Divided had big, bold ideas in just about every aspect of its design, but some of those fall pretty flat, and some of those soar further than could ever be called too close to the sun. I've seen a lot of discourse on this game, and don't worry, while I do have problems with some things in the game, I think my praise of it far outweighs the game's lows. I'd like to spend much more time talking about the ingenuity of the game's design rather than its sort of bland story. Today, I'd like to dive deep into Deus Ex Mankind Divided. We'll be talking about gameplay, mechanics, story, and everything in between. If you haven't seen my previous videos on the Deus Ex series, I would highly recommend that you go check those out to give yourselves proper context for where the series is at by this time. Hey Dad, it's me, your favorite son, and today I'd like to talk about Deus Ex Mankind Divided. The team behind Deus Ex Human Revolution originally had no plans for making a sequel, but when the game was incredibly successful, they knew they had to make another entry. Obsidian was actually originally in talks to develop the sequel to Human Revolution, but because of budgetary constraints, the game had to be developed internally. The development began almost immediately after the Missing Link DLC for Human Revolution was finished. The general goal with Mankind Divided was to keep the things that worked and remove the things that didn't. This was easier said than done though, as this goal ended up taking five years to complete. The extended production of the game was chalked up to the upgraded tech that was implemented and the narrative detail. Speaking of narrative, Mary DeMarle had returned to write the scenario for the next Deus Ex game. The team really wanted to explore the aftermath and impact of the Og incident at the end of Human Revolution. This is how Mankind Divided refers to Darrow's mind-controlling augmented folks and turning them into raving beasts. The team was also focused on the ending of the game. They wanted it to be more fluid so that players couldn't just make multiple saves to see all the endings. The general theme of the game was to try and evolve past transhumanism. This next logical step for the team was the division of humanity with the existence of augmentations. The fact that these themes aligned with real-world issues was sort of a coincidence, according to the developers. 
Mankind Divided was meant to be focused in the city of Prague. The team wanted to move across the sea to Europe, since the last game had mostly focused on the U.S. Using Prague also allowed the team to further juxtapose the modern era tech with the classical architecture and design of the past. Adam Jensen obviously returned for the next entry in the series, the first main character to return as a main character in Deus Ex history. Damarl had originally planned for Jensen to die in Human Revolution as one of her early drafts of the script saw him perish. The team wanted to bring him back though because they liked his character and thought that more could be done with him. The director of Mankind Divided, Jean-Francois Dugas, said that the first game was about establishing a base for this new Deus Ex style, and this game was about expanding upon that and taking the series to the next level. The environments were designed to be much more immersive and give players many options of traversal and approach. The team also wanted the environments to be as realistic and detailed as possible. The AI system was also upgraded to respond to players' actions much better. The entire game was run on the Dawn engine, which was built off of the Glacier 2 engine. This one was originally developed by IO Interactive, the studio responsible for the Hitman series. The team again looked to Renaissance artists for inspiration on the art side of things. This time around, they decided to use more blues and grays rather than the golds and blacks of Human Revolution. The team took time designing the aesthetics of all of their environments, and Gollum City itself was specifically based on Kowloon Walled City, a complex in Hong Kong that is incredibly interesting. Michael McCann returned to compose the soundtrack for Mankind Divided. The goal with this OST was to try and communicate the darker themes of the game. McCann wasn't the only person involved with the music, though. Sasha Dekishian, who worked on Borderlands and Tron Evolution, also assisted with the soundtrack. The ending theme itself was composed by Misha Mansour of the prog rock band Periphery. Deus Ex Mankind Divided was announced in April of 2015 after multiple days of a strange ARG slash promotional event called Can't Kill Progress. This was a live stream of a man in an interrogation room, and people watching could choose what the man did or said. The trailer was eventually released, and the game was originally planned for February 23rd, 2016. The game was delayed about four months, which happened to coincide with the five-year anniversary of Deus Ex Human Revolution. Deus Ex Mankind Divided would release on August 23rd, 2016 for PlayStation 4, Windows, and Xbox One. Deus Ex Mankind Divided begins with a voiceover from Jensen. We're back in the shoes of Adam as he begins another mission, but for a new organization. He's working for TF-29, an anti-terrorist task force. But the first thing that we notice here is there's something different about Jensen. He's accepted his augmentations. He's even become sort of cold and aggressive. This will be the setup for his major character change in this game, and the new arc that he's about to go through. For now, the team's mission is in Dubai. They're looking for an arms dealer named Shepard. Their undercover agent, Singh, is going to meet Shepard today at the Desert Jewel Resort Hotel, an unfinished and abandoned building. We're supposed to block access to the atrium, separating the two groups. We have a choice of how we'd like to approach. Just like in Human Revolution, lethal or non-lethal. We drop in and we get to complete our first mission of Mankind Divided. Before we really get into things, we should probably talk about how Mankind Divided plays. Now, you'll be happy to hear that Mankind Divided has the same goal that's been core to the Deus Ex series this whole time allowing players to approach situations in the way they choose, giving players the freedom to decide how they want to go about missions, whether they want to kill everyone in sight, take a stealthy approach with no deaths on their hands, or some gray in between all that. 
Mankind Divided very much has this in mind, and with its incredibly detailed level design, it might be the peak example of it in the entire series. The game just allows for so much exploration and choice. There were so many points throughout my playthrough where I had similar feelings to human revolution. I would find a path that would branch off at multiple points, making decisions at each. By the time I had reached the end of the path, there were multiple forks in the road at my back. These forks made tick marks in my brain so that when I've beaten the game, I can realize how many different things there are to find on subsequent playthroughs. The measure of a good immersive sim is that these tick marks number in the hundreds. But what's different in Mankind Divided systems? Well, firstly, the augmentation system has been expanded. Before, we were given access to a multitude of different augmentations that could change our style of play. Each of these a little tweak, upgrade, or another ornament to be added to the Christmas tree, but like a sick ornament that lets you blow stuff up or go invisible. Most of the augmentations we have in the last game have returned, but we have extra augmentations, ones that seem to have miraculously appeared, almost like a gift. These augs are experimental and when used will increase the amount of power consumed by Jensen's system meaning that we have to balance our power output when activating these. We'll usually have to deactivate another AUG to activate one of the experimental ones. This is an interesting system, but most of these AUGs never really seemed necessary. They were pretty fun for the most part, an omni blade that can be shot out at enemies or the ability to hack things remotely, but there's a side quest that we can complete about halfway through the game that gets rid of this shackle, meaning we can just infinitely equip any of these augments once we get to that point, so the system isn't that constrained. I will say that the augments have the same feeling and use that they did in Human Revolution. They're incredibly useful, they feel fun, and the amount of them give us a large variety to choose from. This provides differing builds which makes the game even more dynamic. Each experience different and Jensen can effectively be tailored to the player themselves. This adds another layer to the immersive sim. The approach of the level isn't the only thing that conforms to the player's whims anymore, but the gameplay itself does too. The cover system has been upgraded slightly, making it easier to use. We can now round corners, hop over cover, or pop to other pieces of cover much easier than before. This is a welcome change, and it was a system that I used quite often throughout the course of my playthrough. We of course can still interact with useless things, we can throw stuff, which for some reason this game's physics system was the one that I fucked around with the most. I can't be too sure why, it just felt really satisfying to whip stuff at walls in this entry. We have a new radial menu that kind of makes the quick select menu at the bottom of the screen useless, but we have both for whatever reason. The UI has also been upgraded overall and looks a lot cleaner. I honestly prefer this design over Human Revolutions by a mile. It's super clean, fine lines are everywhere, very, very minimal, and if we're to think that this is an in-world menu, then it entirely fits with that. Not a ton of flair, just straight information. The game is also heavily upgraded in the graphics department. It looks amazing in general. The world and environments are incredibly detailed, they feel lived in, and the visual style is just stunning. Not talking directly about aesthetics, but with regard to fidelity, this is the best looking Deus Ex game yet. There were so many moments in this game that I stopped to just stare at the world. The cutscenes also look a lot better, and it made me realize how much I kind of hated Human Revolution's models. Mankind Divided just looks a lot better in almost every way. Human Revolution does feel a bit more stylized in its world, and I'll certainly give it that, but I can't say I hate looking at this game. There are other small changes, hacking has had a bit of a facelift as well as some additional mechanic changes, but it's nothing too big. The largest change that Mankind Divided would make will be in the world itself and the structure of the missions moving forward, but we'll get to those in a bit. 
Back in our introductory story, Jensen and his team meet some resistance once the meet begins. Gold-masked mercs show up and shoot Shepard, attempting to steal the augmentations in the trade. Here, if we don't make our moves correctly, Sing can die, which is not a game over for us, just a consequence. We can save him or not, but it's entirely up to us. The mission ends in disaster yet again, and we see the Council of Five. This is made up of some familiar faces from the first Deus Ex game. Lucius De Beers, Morgan Everett, Elizabeth Duclair, Stanton Dowd, and one we've never seen, Volcard Rand. This council acts as the Illuminati, the ones we've heard so much about throughout the series. Bob Page is also here, a protege to Morgan Everett at the time. The gold-masked men were working for the Illuminati, and the group itself isn't gaining ground very well. They're having trouble maintaining order, as society has become divided ever since the Og incident. Their next move is to try and get the Human Restoration Act passed, a bill that would require augmented individuals to have a control chip inserted in them. We then see Jensen traveling in Ruzika Station, in the city of Prague. He then meets up with Alex Vega, a woman working for the Juggernaut Collective. This is another group that Jensen is working with. The Juggernaut Collective are a hacktivist organization that is led by Janus, the man we heard reference to in the previous game. Their general goal is to fight corruption, but this mostly ends up pitting them against the Illuminati. Alex and Jensen think that the TF-29 operation in Dubai may have been set up, and Vega gives him a chip to plant in the task force's NSN terminal so that they can hear some important conversations. At this moment, the station is blown up, destroyed by terrorists. Jensen tries to save a mother, but he's too late. She's already crushed under the massive weight of the rubble. This is a pretty important and inciting incident for the game. This event will set up most of our story from here on out. It will also set up quite a few themes for the game and the world moving forward. The world of Mankind Divided is a lot different from that of Human Revolution. In the previous entry, augmentations were a very big part of the game. Obviously, we got them and could use them in combat effectively, but the public seemed pretty mistrusting of them. Augmentations made up most of the themes of the game as well, the big questions being asked all centered around this massive milestone in technological advancement. This game too concerns itself quite a bit with augmentations, but not nearly in the same way. The new world has seen a great division between mankind Society has been split apart, segregated into those with augments and those without. This is no longer a fringe issue, one that may spring up in the future. There is totalitarian separation between the two groups, and these two groups don't seem to get along very well. Now, of course, I'm not a huge fan of this plot point. I think the idea in practice is probably fine, but the way that it's executed is not just heavy-handed. It's as if the hand has a 12-ton truck on the back of it. The imagery and separation is clear here, and boy did it cause quite a bit of controversy before and on release. The team decided to market the game with a live-action short called Mechanical Apartheid, which people were not too happy about whatsoever. The team also used the term Aug Lives Matter within the game and maintained that it was an unfortunate coincidence. These things all paint a picture that the team wanted to move the Augs into the realm of racism metaphor, or even anti-Semitism metaphor. But it's really just so overdone. Its execution seems insensitive, corny, and misplaced. I understand the goal, but when we compare this game's themes to the themes of the previous entry, it really becomes clear that we've exited the territory of the subtle. Human Revolution asked many questions, like what it meant to be human, what the purpose of control was, and whether humanity could go too far with technology. This game doesn't seem to ask very many questions at all. It seems to just tell you that racism or augism is bad. I don't really find any of it overtly offensive or anything. Maybe the marketing was poorly managed, but it's mostly just a lot more boring. 
I was kind of disappointed after starting this game, and a couple hours into the story, I realized what it was. All I could muster was a meek and meager, that's it? While the situation makes sense, and sure, it's the next logical story beat to make, it seems like the easy one. It's certainly not a challenging narrative setup for the player or for the team itself. There are some interesting things within the story of Mankind Divided that I did enjoy, but its general plot and world was not one of them. Jensen wakes up in his apartment, an area that we can explore quite a bit for some extra items and secrets as per usual. There's a hidden panel with some useful items and a loose floorboard with some goodies underneath. We can also use a TV to contact an old friend, David Seraf. He gives us a side mission that we'll talk about in just a bit. We head to Kohler's facility in Prague, who fixes our augmentations for us. He also notifies us of the experimental augmentations that he found installed. These are the ones we talked about before. He says that they had to have been installed in the past couple of years. It's actually been two years since the end of Deus Ex Human Revolution. The game doesn't specifically canonize any ending from that game. The only thing it really does canonize is the destruction of Panchea. Jensen was found in the ocean and was somehow nursed back to health, fixed yet again. His memories are a bit blurry though, and he doesn't have a great recollection of those events. Our next goal is to head over to TF-29's headquarters, which are actually hidden underneath a store called Praha Dovos. But before we can head over there, we should actually talk about the city that Mankind Divided is set in. Most of the previous games in the series have worked off of a mission structure. We would take a large plane to different missions, heading to vastly different parts of the world. Obviously, Human Revolution broke this mold slightly. Detroit and Hengsha were larger cities that we could freely explore, and we would spend much of our time there. Mankind Divided takes this idea a little bit further with just one city, Prague. This is now our hub city, and most of the game will take place here. We will leave the city a couple times throughout the game, but only briefly, usually for one mission while we head to another area, but we'll quickly be back to Prague. We have tons of side missions we can do here, many vendors that we can trade or buy and sell from, and tons of exploring to do. Now, obviously, this is a great idea for a series like Deus Ex. It takes that immersive sim title just another step further. It adds another dimension to the immersion. Now the environment itself is immersive, and it's easily the best part of the game. There were so many times that I just got lost in the city. Not literally, I just couldn't stop exploring it. I would see an open window and would need to figure out how to get up there. There were a few times where I broke into an apartment and stole a bunch of items, only to realize later that it was a part of a side mission, but there were many times that the things I found never surfaced again. They were just there, meant to be found if we went spelunking through the concrete caves that the city presents us with. Weaving through vents, hacking into garages, and eventually popping out in apartments that you realize are connected back to the beginning of your loop is just wild. I'm sure if exposed to Prague enough, you could eventually come to know this city like the back of your hand, and that's what makes it so gorgeous. The game encourages you to explore as well. We can buy information from vendors or come across it in side quests. These will be marked as points of interest. These are usually apartments that might hold some special items or hidden places that could have some secret equipment. It should also be noted that there's a specific antique store in Prague. It doesn't really have anything special inside, just a cool little portal easter egg. Yeah, just a nice reference, that's all. Nothing of importance to my YouTube channel whatsoever. Nothing significant to see here. This basement actually has a bunch of video game covers from other Eidos games. Hitman is here, Tomb Raider, and Obviously, Legacy of Cain being represented is the most important and prominent to me. 
Most video game cities are pretty vapid, tons of blank storefronts that were never intended for us to enter. And don't get me wrong, Prague has no shortage of unenterable doors, but the city feels large. It feels like it holds secrets. I put a bunch of hours in one playthrough of this game and add on some more for a new game plus run, and I still feel like there are things that the city has kept hidden from me. The place begs to be explored. It's what it was made for. If there's some sort of universal destiny, then Prague was meant to have every avenue of its architecture examined, and you and me were meant to do it. Like New Age cartographers in the undiscovered land of the digital. The city itself also has an aesthetic all of its own. Let's ignore the propaganda posters and augmented segregation for a moment, and we'll find visually striking advertisements that are at once creative and dystopian. They transcend the cyberpunk tropes of screens on buildings and move past it to something new and probably more unfortunately realistic. There are still just screens on buildings every once in a while, but like I said in the development section, this trend exhibits a juxtaposition between the modern and the classical. Just as Human Revolution used the Renaissance as an inspiration for an environment, this game uses classic architecture as a backboard, a comparison for its modern advancements. This comparison is chilling, seeing the creative and passion-fueled art that are the buildings of this ancient city, set against the bland and formulaic, bright, poppy, capitalist-fueled advertisements creates a visual that's almost too real. Because it is. Prague overall is amazing, wonderful to explore, but also ready to be unfurled in front of you. Eventually, we head over to the TF-29 headquarters. Here, we plant the bug in the neural subnet and get an assignment from our boss, Miller. He wants us to head over to Ruzika Station to investigate the attack. The Shek police are the ones investigating, so TF-29 doesn't have jurisdiction. We find a forensics tech there named Smiley. There's a storage device inside that holds some evidence Smiley wants us to get. Smiley has to examine the evidence after we give it to him, so it's going to take some time. We're supposed to go talk to Dr. Delara, TF-29's psychiatrist. She asks us some questions to analyze Jensen's emotional state and opinions on what he has to do. Just then, Alex says that they caught something on the bug, and we meet up with her to talk about the contents of the discussions. We find out that Miller was talking to his boss, Joseph Manderley. Manderley told him that he needed to blame the ARC for the train station attack and Dubai. The ARC are the Augmented Rights Coalition. They're a group that, obviously, fights for the rights of augmented individuals. They are suspected to have been involved in some of the terrorism as of late, considering the fact that AUGs haven't been treated very well in society. Just then, Miller gives us a mission to head out to Gollum City, where the ARC are headed. He tells us that some corrupted footage from the train station shows an AUG dropping bombs off in a bag that is commonly used by Talos Rucker, the ARC's leader. This is the point in the game where we begin to mistrust Miller. That fact is made plainly clear. Obviously, the main story sort of pushes us against him. I do like how this was done in Mankind Divided. Like I talked about previously, Human Revolution did a similar thing with Seraph, but it wasn't as overt as it is here. There, it was more of an implication and an assumption on the part of the player, especially if they were used to Deus Ex games. We have to head to Gollum City. As I said before, Gollum City is based on a real-life place called Kowloon Walled City. This was a place in Hong Kong that is actually incredibly interesting. Its origins go back hundreds of years as a military fort. It eventually became a squatting village during the Chinese Civil War. The reason it was so interesting, though, is because it was incredibly densely populated. In just this small area, 33,000 people resided. Wildly unsafe with a shockingly low quality of life, the city was eventually demolished in 1994, and Hong Kong turned it into a park. Gollum City shares many similarities with this real-world place. It's densely packed and populated, a refuge made for augmented individuals to flee to. 
that was originally built to be home to the working class of Prague, but eventually became a ghetto for Augs. Here, we try to gain access to the ARC. We find a man named Tibor who works in their ranks. He gives us some information, and we eventually run into Viktor Marchenko, a higher-ranking member of the group. He warns us to turn back, making some veiled threats in the process. When we finally meet Rucker, he tells us that ARC genuinely had nothing to do with the bombing, or at least he didn't. He seems honest, like he just wants better for augmented individuals, but there's a power struggle within the group. This is one of our big conversation boss battles in the game. It's a similar system to what we saw in Human Revolution, though this time the alignment analysis system doesn't sit over top of every character's face all of the time. Here, of course, we can either convince Rucker or not. He wants to give us evidence to confirm what he says about ARC, but before he can, he dies, spitting blood and his augs separating from his own body. Jensen has to make a messy exit from the complex, heading back to Prague. He's quite frustrated at what just happened because he feels like he was set up. He thinks that someone sent him there to frame him for Rucker's death. Jensen really doesn't know who to trust at this moment. Things are starting to get really murky, and anyone could be an enemy. Fletcher has decoded the DSD, though, and it's time to see what was on it. Before we do that, though, I'd like to talk about the side quests of Mankind Divided. Human Revolution had some great side missions, and Mankind Divided honestly doesn't disappoint in this regard. Most of the side missions are missable, meaning as we progress through the story, if we don't pick them up and complete them, they're gone. A lot of them also continue throughout the story. The single one that we talked about so far, the important mission to remove the shackles from your experimental augmentations, is picked up early on, but can only be completed once we've progressed through the story. These objectives do a good job at building the world of Deus Ex a little better, though. One very interesting mission for me was the Samizdat mission. This begins when we found out that someone has hacked TF-29's front company. We have to track them down and eventually source it to a small conspiracy publication that's being run out of the sewers. We have to keep them from exposing TF-29 and can even get some dirt on Picus by raiding a nearby bank in Prague. This dirt happens to be some flight dossiers of a shot-down airplane. The most interesting part of this side mission for me, though, was the conversation we have with the group's leader, K. Samizdat thinks that they know what's going on. They think that they know that the media is being controlled or that things are being covered up. It sort of parallels the real world. There are tons of people that think they've cracked the code. What's happening behind the scenes is a child's riddle to them. They already know. But Jensen reveals that it's so much more complicated than they could ever imagine. They aren't even close. Could they ever even fathom that Picus is actually run by an artificial intelligence that diverts the public's attention? It's this reflection of the modern world and real life that makes this little group so interesting. I found it so genuine and honest. There's also the incredibly interesting side mission where we have to track down a serial killer that's been ripping people's augs out. The short story tries to give us a red herring and convince us that it's the lead officer that's actually doing the killings, but we find out that it's the latest victim's sister, who kidnaps herself to lure out Jensen. But when we take her down, the lead officer thinks we must be the killer. This was one of the few times that I didn't manage to win a conversation battle in this game, and the officer ended up attacking me. I was forced to take him down. This was not a favorable result at all. Jensen actually has to call Chang at TF-29 and tell him that there's two people dead here and they needed picked up. A lot of these little stories are very interesting, just a really nice fine-tuning of missions and systems throughout the course of this series. I think a lot of these little stories are more interesting and actually work better than the main story does, to be honest. Speaking of side missions, there is a side mission involving David Seraph, who has now had to sell off Seraph Industries after the heat with augmentations. He's trying to help Jensen find out what happened to him back in Panchea or Alaska and how he got these experimental augmentations. But wait, that doesn't sound like David Seraph. One day, people will move on from the incident, and when that happens, we'll be ready for it. I'm glad we caught up, Adam. If 
always tried to look out for you, you know. Sounds just a bit off, doesn't it? That's because it is. Rick Miller did the voice for David Seraf in this entry, not Stephen Shellen. Miller is just doing a good enough impression of Shellen to pass if you weren't paying attention. Now, I did a little digging on this, and there's actually a lot more here than you'd think. There was some fuss in 2012 because Shellen had uploaded a video where he was rambling about Area 51, the Illuminati, and fruit flies. The video itself was part of some sort of comedy channel and was actually a skit. People didn't realize it was a skit at first, though, and publications started reporting that Shellen was having some sort of meltdown. This wasn't true, though, and apparently, again, according to Shellen, there was a disagreement about pay with Eidos, and he decided not to come back for the sequel game. Ironically, Shellen was then actually blacklisted from Hollywood and started to have a legit breakdown. He started posting conspiracy videos and was, of course, pretty outspoken in 2020 about a certain virus and masks. My whole point here is that this conspiracy has truly permeated the game and seeped into the real world. Mankind Divided is so genius because it's created its own real world conspiracy. I genuinely just thought this was relevant because Seraph's voice sounded so off in the sequel, and I ended up going down a rabbit hole of useless information. Once we head back to Fletcher, he tells us that the timing mechanism on one of the bombs was from a Stanic wristwatch, a local company in Prague. We have to track down the man behind the shop, who isn't very easy to find, as he's currently being targeted by some local gang assassins. We eventually meet him in a bar, and he reveals that his daughter was the one making the bombs, not him. She used to be in the military on bomb disposal and had hallucinations. She was discharged and became depressed. Stanick thinks her new friends are to blame. We can actually head to Miller's apartment since Jensen's distrust with him is at an all-time high. At this point in the game, doing main story missions in a certain order will give us differing outcomes, further altering each playthrough. We actually don't find anything on Miller as the evidence shows us that he's looking for information himself. We meet Alex again, who tells us that a similar death was found to Rutgers. A woman was poisoned at VersaLife, and it was made to look like an accident. The two think the culprit is a bioweapon called Orchid. The only way to find out is to access Miller's neural subnet. This is incredibly risky, but the rewards outweigh that risk. We access the NSN and we have to interface with a brand new mode called Breach. Now, this whole section is actually kind of interesting. We're using an avatar in a sort of digital world, interfacing with information. It's really interesting, and sort of vaguely reminds me of that small section at the end of Invisible War. We have to steal some data using hacking and platforming to get past different firewalls and security measures. It's not a bad little section, but there's two problems with it. First, it's literally the only appearance of this in the main story. Just looking at the main missions, this is completely isolated and makes almost no sense. It seems very out of place to just have this style of mission one time. I kept thinking it was going to reappear again, and it never did. The other problem is that Breach is really just an introduction to another mode available for Mankind Divided, Breach Mode. This was sort of the multiplayer mode for this game. It wasn't really multiplayer, mostly a challenge mode that saw you competing against other players in leaderboards. Each breach level sees us going through defenses and essentially solving a puzzle to get to the server data as fast as we can and escaping as fast as we can. We can choose our loadout before we start, choose modifiers for the missions to make it easier or harder. We can even buy nice little booster packs for small amounts of money that will give us a variety of items and skins. It's a very weird addition to the game that seems almost unnecessary. The game was actually made a standalone free product as well. It mostly seems like a way to get some extra money, not to mention there are actually microtransactions that are in the single player game itself. There was certainly some shifty business going on with Mankind Divided. According to an anonymous source, most of these microtransactions overall were sprung on Eidos weeks before the game was to be finished. They had no idea that they were going to be implemented or were required at all until the final weeks of production. This doesn't surprise me considering the time when the game came out was sort of the heyday for this sort of thing. 
After we get through the breach, we see the other half of the conversation Miller was having with Manderley. Miller logs off and Bob Page logs on. Apparently, we were wrong not to trust Miller because he has no involvement with the Illuminati and doesn't even know he's working for them. They had an inside man at the ARC and poisoned Rucker with Orchid. This will apparently force Nathaniel Brown's hand. Nathaniel B. is the CEO of the Santau Group, who are currently working on a construction called Rabaya, an entire city that would be meant for augmented individuals. Jensen heads to meet Janus, who won't actually show his face, just an ever-switching series of other people's faces. Janus wants us to head to the Palisade Bank and break into Versalife's vault. There could be some information on Versalife there. We're cut off from Janus and have to escape from some sentry drones. We actually have two options here moving forward in regards to missions. We can either go save Stanek's daughter, who he has tracked down, or we can head to the vault. I decided to save Allison as she was supposedly the bomb maker and could have some information on who was behind all this. When we go here, we find Allison in the throes of a wild cult that's about to go through with their ascension ritual, moving past the physical world and into the machine god. We can convince her to stay and talk her down. Eventually, she'll tell us about a facility in the Swiss Alps called Garm. If we head to the Versalife vault, we can actually hear footage of Megan Reed talking to Bob Page, informing him about the dangers of the orchid which she's created. Either way, we get the same information. It's just about the way that it happens. We head to Garm and are quickly ambushed by Marchenko. He injects Jensen with Orchid, which Adam luckily survives. We have to escape the place, picked up by our pilot. We head back to Prague one final time to find that the city has fallen into the tendrils of martial law. <coughs> no, not that martial law. This is not good for us because a curfew has been instituted. We can no longer roam freely throughout the streets of Prague. We now have to sneak our way through. This is where those vents, hidden pathways, weaving through buildings, and all-around detail-heavy city comes in handy. This is also something to be expected. Even though it is interesting and welcome, this is sort of a staple for the Deus Ex series. This whole concept of turning our safe area into a dangerous one was pioneered by the first game back when we had to escape from UNATCO. We give Alex the sample of Orchid so that the Juggernaut Collective can examine the substance. ARC is being set up as a scapegoat for the upcoming attack that Marchenko is planning. Miller tells us that he's just as in the dark as us. He tells us that Marchenko is connected to the Diwali, a Shek gang that operates out of Eastern Europe. We find out that Marchenko is going to attack a large convention tomorrow in London. This convention is being held by Nathaniel Brown himself. We meet Alex back at Jensen's apartment. She's found out that Brown is going to lose money if the Human Restoration Act passes. It would mean a massive influx of people to Rabia, and thus, he's been campaigning against it. Killing Brown will guarantee the act gets passed. We head out to London for our final mission of the game. We go with Miller and a team to London's Apex Center, where the convention is being held. Brown, stupidly, doesn't want to call off the event. He wants to keep it going because he thinks it will show the terrorists that they can't stop him. We eventually find out that the gold masks have already invaded and replaced the actual guards. We can take out the fake guards, and this is where the ending gets tricky. The moment that we're noticed, Marchenko contacts us and tells us to head to him. He won't set off his explosives he has placed in the next building if we come to meet him now. But regardless, his soldiers begin firing upon civilians. We can do these things in multiple different orders, which will affect what actually happens. Miller's fate is dependent on whether we have an antidote for his poisoning. The delegates can be saved or killed, and we eventually will fight Marchenko himself. This is the only actual boss fight in the entire game. This was probably in response to most people actually hating the boss fights in Human Revolution. There's also a lot of ways we can take out Marchenko. In a throwback to the original Deus Ex, we can actually get a kill switch for Marchenko that will automatically kill him. We can also just EMP him and take him out with a stealth takedown, or shoot him in the head a million times. Regardless, we jump ahead to one week later. Jensen is in his apartment with Alex. They watch the news and learn about the act and whether it passed or not. Jensen is determined to find out who is behind everything and who Janus is. 
we see a PICUS news report on current events, which is affected by the decisions that we made throughout the game. We have one more scene of the council meeting again, talking about what happened in London. We find out that Delara, the psychiatrist from TF29, is actually involved in the Illuminati herself. Jensen is being watched closely, and so is his meeting with Janus. The entire ending to this game is just really awkward. I do think that they achieved their goal here and made the thing open so that players could approach it how they wanted, but in doing so, I think it sacrifices a lot of cohesion in the story. Even the final mission just ends really strangely and is very abrupt. It's an odd choice, and I just wish they had wrapped it up better. Not only that, but the last we see of Jensen and this crusade of his to find Janus is also pretty odd. It felt like the game wanted to set up another entry more than they actually wanted to finish this one. Assumingly, this was setting up the final entry in a trilogy, but it just feels like this disjointed, awkward middle piece. This wasn't the final ending for Mankind Divided, though. There are still a couple other things to talk about in the form of DLC. This game did have its fair share of downloadable supplements. Before we talk about those, we should actually talk about Mankind Divided's pre-order bonuses. There was an incredibly confusing system that Square had determined for the game where you can choose rewards for your pre-order at different tiers. You could eventually get early release of the game, but it was also convoluted and honestly pretty predatory towards the consumer. People complained, and rightly so, so they cancelled it and offered everyone who pre-ordered all of the rewards. This must have been another one of those things that Square forced on Eidos. One of these pre-order bonuses, though, was an extra in-game mission. It would later become available to everyone as a free download and can now be played under the DLC menu in Mankind Divided. This was called Desperate Measures and is literally just a side mission, but played as a weird little one-off thing. It's very short and disjointed when played on its own. The whole thing revolves around us trying to figure out why the footage of the train station bombing was corrupted. It's an alright story, but should have just been included in the base game in the first place. The second DLC is called System Rift and was released a month after the game itself. The idea is pretty cool. Pritchard contacts Jensen to help him out with another job, infiltrating the Palisade Blade, which is a data storage facility for highly sensitive information. That part of the DLC is interesting, and it contains an entirely new area, which is nice. Also, seeing Pritchard and Jensen's weird little bantering come back was also a neat surprise. But half of the DLC is literally a lore explanation as to why the Breach mode exists. It's so odd, and I wish they wouldn't force Breach into the story at all. If you're going to have a cash grab, just make it a cash grab. Don't try to rationalize it. The third DLC, A Criminal Past, is actually the most interesting one of the bunch. It's framing devices Jensen telling the TF-29 psychiatrist stories about his past. He tells her about his first mission with the task force, one where he had to infiltrate a high-security prison that's super remote in Arizona. Actually, an incredibly interesting design. The only problem is that it's called the Penthouse. But the full name is actually, um, the, uh, Penley T. Housefather Correctional Facility. What in the Charles Entertainment Cheese? In reality, though, this DLC is actually really interesting. The prison is a good and interesting environment. We even have our augments removed at the beginning of the game, which adds some challenge to the whole thing. We can get them back pretty easily, but there's some genuine downsides to having them. It's just a really nice change of pace and a really good piece of content. Deus Ex Mankind Divided is, overall, a flawed beast. One that can pounce on its prey at one moment, tearing sinew from bone, efficiently eviscerating, but yet can't manage to sip water from a stream. The game manages to be so incredibly interesting and fun to play. The environments are beautiful and so well crafted. There's so much detail here, so much intrigue, so much to do and find. The things that we can do in those environments are incredibly fun as well. This game remembers the best thing that Deus Ex is all about, and it's giving me the ability to be creative in its world, allowing me to try and break the simulation. 
challenging me to it even. The game is incredibly replayable too. Going back to revisit missions and objectives means finding new ways to solve them, maybe ways that are even more efficient, better than the first failed playthrough. But on top of everything, Mankind Divided is genuinely fun. The story itself is not that interesting. If you remember way back when I was talking about Deus Ex at the beginning of the series, I talked about the art of the conspiracy theory. That is totally and completely gone from this game. Don't get me wrong at all, I think going in a new direction is great for the series. I think that with Human Revolution, the team really decided that they were going to try something new with this world. That game's story was very far removed from what the original Deus Ex had done, but at least it had felt like it had something else interesting to offer. If you're going to take things away, then you have to offer something else that's going to make up for it. Mankind Divided doesn't really feel like it offers anything to make up for it in terms of narrative. It has moments of being interesting, but overall it's sort of boring. It doesn't accomplish much, and it doesn't ask any important questions. Maybe the only question it asks is not even a question, just a statement. If it is asking a question, then it's asking one that people have already answered, or at the very least, one that no one cares to have a conversation about. The most interesting thing about these games, one of the things that's tied them together up until this point, is that they all seem to have something to say. Mankind Divided doesn't really feel like that. It seems like it's trying to say things that other people have said, but with the new Deus Ex. It's very odd. And the catch-22 with the entire game is that the game is just so damn fun to play. It might be my preferred Deus Ex to play outside of the first game. And honestly, with how the first game performs on my machine, if I'm inclined to just pick up a Deus Ex game for a few hours, it honestly might be this one. Because overall, there's just more here for me to find, more here for me to do, more for me to see. And getting lost in an interesting city is way more enjoyable than something like Detroit. Human Revolution was great, but this game just did that aspect of it much better. Mankind Divided sits somewhere in the middle for me. It's a real shame in general, because it could have been something great. Mankind Divided was met with pretty decent reviews. Most people praised its design and structure, but some had issues with its narrative. The game itself sold decently, though not as well as Human Revolution. It didn't seem to be a total disaster, though, because it was reported that Mankind Divided was one of the reasons for Square Enix's net profit increase in 2016. There would not be another mainline entry to the Deus Ex series after Mankind Divided. But before we talk about the end of the Deus Ex series, we have a few more things to go over, like a Deus Ex spin-off mobile game, multiple novels, and comics. But we'll talk about that next time. Bye, Dad.